We're going to start off with Philip Giambri from Three of Cups, the Ancient Mariner. You all know him. He's the Gene Shepherd of the present scene. Welcome to the stage. We're honored to have him. Thank you. Thank you. I have two pieces. Uh, next month will mark the 107th anniversary of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire, where 146 people died in just 18 minutes. It was the deadliest industrial disaster in the history of New York City. They died from fire, smoke inhalation, or falling to their deaths because fire truck ladders only reached up to the fifth floor then. Most of them were Jewish and Italian immigrant women aged 16 to 23. The oldest was 48, the youngest was 11. The managers locked the doors to the stairwells and the exits to prevent pilferage and unauthorized breaks. Many of the workers jumped from the 8th, 9th, and 10th floors. That fire led to legislation requiring improved factory safety standards and helped spur the growth of the Ladies' Garment Workers Union, which fought for better working conditions for sweatshop workers. That factory was located on Washington Place, just blocks from here. Associated Press, November 25th, 2012, Dhaka, Bangladesh. 112 people were killed in a fire that raced through a multi-story garment factory outside Bangladesh. Associated Press, May 13, 2013, Savar, Bangladesh. Following the collapse of a Bangladesh garment factory building, the death toll has reached 1,127, making it the worst disaster in the history of the global garment industry. During the Great Depression, my mom had to quit school at 17 to work as a seamstress in a sweatshop. She eventually worked her way up to a job in a union clothing factory, thanks mostly to the Japanese bombing Pearl Harbor. Looking back at the terrible working conditions, it seemed now the only difference between a clothing factory and a sweatshop was that one was a legal business with union representation and the other wasn't. Conditions are appalling in both environments, although agreeably a bit worse in sweatshops. To me, it was just mom's job. The Amalgamated Garment Workers Union values only tailors as union members. They're exclusively men. Women are regulated to machine work for the length of their careers. Union shop stewards tell members who to vote for in all the elections from union locals up to presidential races. They watch as you vote in the shop and you vote the union ticket or you suffer the consequences. Mom, like most women, goes along with the program, keeps her head down, pushes pants through the machines. Violence is common during elections in the shops, but is relegated mostly to men. Women keep their mouth shut and their head down. The young man can start as a bundle boy, carrying bundles of clothing to the female machine operators. If he's sharp and or has connections, He'll become an apprentice tailor in a few years, and if he's stamped okay by the union and the other tailors, his career is made. Women have only two options, push clothes through the machines until they either quit or they die. Sewing machine oper operators are paid piecework. That is, they're paid for each piece of clothing they complete their portion of the job on. Mistakes are costly because they have to be corrected. That cuts the production time for the day. During World War II, Mom works at the Philadelphia Quartermaster Depot, sewing linings and heavy army wool coats. Dad picks her up after work every day in the cab he's driving, and they load all of her mistakes in the cab. We spend our family evening unstitching mistakes, so Mom won't lose time at work. She learns quick and she works hard. Over the years, she changes jobs often and progresses up to a coveted position as a braid stitcher. Braid stitches sew the shiny satin stripes on the side of men's tuxedo pants. It's a four-part operation, sewing two sides of two braids, considered one of the better positions in the factory because it pays a higher piece rate. Mom becomes highly skilled very fast and gains a reputation in the industry. She's known everywhere as Be the Braid, st braid Stitcher and is sought after by all tuxedo manufacturers. She's a workhorse and she flourishes. Other factory owners are always trying to draft Mom to work for them. She now commands the highest rates, and if she really busts ass, she can make a sustenance living. But she still needs a second income for us to survive, so on her lunch breaks, she sells chocolates to the other workers that my Uncle Jimmy makes by hand. Arthritis eventually cripples Mom's fingers. She has to quit working when she's 55. 
She never collects a penny in benefits because the union contract requires that you work until 62 to be eligible for any pension and health benefits, no matter how many years you worked. 38 years of indentured servitude, and she's left with no union benefits whatsoever. Fuck you, amalgamated garment workers. Union. <laughs> Your alligator skin shoes and those shark skin suits came at the cost of my mom's arthritic <laughs> fingers and the millions of other union women whose lungs are choked with clothing dust while you suck the lifeblood from them and prosper. Unions helped create the middle class in America, yet you became the same as the monsters you were supposed to protect us from. These jobs all go overseas now, and the workers there are subjected to the same horrible work condition that spurred the birth of the union movement here. Our greedy American companies buy from whoever makes the cheapest garments, and these workers average 20 cents an hour. Some of our friendly union goons continue to make money selling union labels to factory owners who have them sewn into their imported garments. So we all think we're buying American. Look for the union label? Fuck you. I'm looking for someone to stand up and fight for the working poor people again. Yeah! You know, there's always that guy in the bar who's seen it all, done it all, knows everybody famous. Well, tonight I'm that guy. <laughs> During the 50s, I'm thinking our Druid commune on Thunder Hill is going to be a safe haven from the Cold War terror sweeping the nation over this atom bomb stuff. You know, kids hiding under school desks to protect themselves from fallout. <laughs> really, we did that stuff. I'm keeping a fantasy travel journal, neatly written in small print, on a roll of toilet tissue. By the way, there's a few rare bootleg copies still circulating in the underground as the toilet papers. <laughs> you can imagine my shock when Kerouac takes off with my journal and leaves Thunder Hill forever. When news of his success in San Francisco reaches us, no one seems to notice but me. I'm still bitter at the loss of my journal, and now Jack's passing it off as his own time on the road. I'm angry and restless, but I try and meditate my way out of it, and I mellow out for a couple more years, until I finally leave Thunder Hill in August of 1969 for a concert at Max Yasker's farm. <laughs> Wavy Gravy asked me to help at the hog farm kitchen, feeding hordes of pilgrims who showed up stoned, wet, and hungry. After a brief fling with a hippie singer, I uh, leave the festival with Janice and Jimmy, touring with them on backup tambourine until the drugs did them both in. Almost finished me off, too. I decide to live and get clean, though, and I hitched to a desert commune I heard about on the road. The vibes weren't very good, where, good there, and Manson was keeping all the women to himself, so when Keezy's pranksters passed through, I hop on the bus and get off with a hallucinogenic haze and a hippie commune in Taos. At my request, Tom Wolf make no mention of me on the bus at that time. <laughs> I spend the next year cleansing my body and spirit through tantric yoga and a lot of peyote buttons. Peter and Dennis arrived the following summer with the Easy Rider crew, and I leave with them for New Orleans. Next thing I know, I'm waking up with two ladies in a cemetery after a long acid trip. <laughs> the Marine Corps gets me clean again, but I came back from Nam with a noticeable limp, a couple of medals, and a bad attitude about the damn war. At a peace rally in D.C., I hooked up with an old lover and found the sexual electricity still there. I convinced her to join me on a peace mission in North Vietnam, and our relationship is really deepening and going well. And until that damn Hanor Jane publicity wrecked her career overnight. And she, she hasn't spoken to me since. I leave the movement and I move to Hollywood, where my modest hair salon becomes an overnight blockbuster when Warren played me in shampoo. Beautiful women flocked to my shop and until the National Empire published that old village voice picture of Travolta and me embracing at the Stonewall after the riot. So long ago, you know, we'd met as young men in the village. After a brief fling, we remained friends for years until I realized he borrowed my choreography for his moves in Saturday Night Fever. I quit Scientology and I haven't spoken to him since then. Polanski convinced me to escape to Paris with him, where we're hanging out with Richard Harris and drinking heavily. Harris drags me off to Ireland for the Euro release of MacArthur Park, but he splits a couple weeks later when I joined the IRA. The bombing cost me seven years in a damp cell in Northern Ireland. The TB's in remission now, and the new left eye almost matches the color of my right one. 
I worked my way back to the States on a tramp steamer. <coughs> down and out. I called my old buddy, John Lee Hooker. He's living in Texas. He offers me a touring gig on Blues Harp. I spent the next couple of years on the road just trying to stay drug free and maintain, you know. I learned the hard way though that alcohol is just another drug. Backstage after a Stones concert at the Garden, James and Carly find me passed out by the light boards. They offered me a chance to stay at their place and clean up on the vineyard. Your Sylvain is a giant hit, but I was hurt and angry that Carly would criticize you so publicly. I leave the vineyard for Esalen Institute at Big Sur and a new life on the West Coast with self-indulgence. Est helped me kick the heroin habit. And in the spring at Sundance, Redford confines that my woman's first movement script will be jointly produced by Bill Jean King and Bobby Riggs. I'll tell you, things are looking perfect. <laughs> I'm back in L.A. Happiness seems finally within my grasp. It's a joyous time. And I'll tell you, after edging out Brian Wilson with the Songwriter of the Year Award, that's the final feather of my cap this year. The publicized breakup with Cher was devastating. So. <laughs> I split for New York, mending my broken heart at Plato's retreat. After two climactic years, I realized that sex is not the answer either. I take up residence at Studio 54 doing poppers and pills with Capote till Lennon and Chapin drag me off to Hollywood for what turns out to be another two-year bender. Belushi's death hits me hard. I leave show business for a bit with a stint as an Amway rep. I look up with my buddy Cato's to get, get away from it all. O.J. Barr is my white Bronco. I never see him in a damn Bronco again. <laughs> Severely depressed, I leave L.A. and months later, I'm in a methadone clinic in the East Village. Panhandling on St. Mark's Place, I run into the woman destined to change my life, Melanie. We shared a blissful weekend together at the Woodstock Festival, but her candles in the rain hit the charts big and we lost touch over the years. Fame is fleeting, though. Now... She's just another aging flower child with a guitar hanging on St. Mark's place. This time we really connect though. He's settled in a tiny apartment across from the old electric circus. We're doing provocative primitive movement classes with Fosse, primal screen therapy with Yoko and John, biofeedback session with the young Bill Gates, and blissful sunny summer days skinny dipping at Smitty's up in New Paltz. I finally found peace. Somehow George tracks us down and begs us to do a duet at of I'd like to teach the world to sing at his upcoming benefit concert for Bangladesh. Everyone who's anyone is on stage that night. It's being broadcast all over the world. With Harrison and Clapton backing us up on guitar, we bring the house down and everyone joins in for the final chorus. It's an amazing moment of spiritual unity captured forever on that Time magazine cover. I'll never forget it. In the early 80s, hard drugs are overwhelming the East Village and I can't go back there again. Melanie and I leave the city for the Catskills, where we open the Whole Earth Health Food Store. We settle into a quiet life in flannel shirts, bib front jeans, and earth shoes. <laughs> hey, we're doing great. Business is good up at the store. Melanie joined Weight Watcher. She's losing a lot of weight, you know. She's going to start singing again, too. Me? I'm down there for an interview with the New Yorker about my new book, Casey Should Have Gone Further. I'm still 12 stepping on and off, but hey, you can buy me a pint of Guinness if you feel like it. And hey, if you ever get upstate to Shandekin, stop by and say hello at the store. Thank you.